From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. In 2013, former Central Falls Mayor Charles Moreau, who pleaded guilty to a federal fraud charge, was sentenced to two years in prison. But soon, he could be a free man, thanks to a ruling in a separate case. Combating corruption has been the hallmark of the Rhode Island U.S. Attorney's Office, but what does this development mean to future public sector fraud investigations? Our guest on the first half of Newsmakers, Rhode Island U.S. Attorney Peter Nerona. Then... A bill before state lawmakers would punish towns that don't adequately fund their pension plans. If passed, the law would authorize the treasurer's office to withhold state aid until towns pay what they should into their retirement accounts. Is it fiscal extortion or an answer to tackling out of control unfunded liabilities in cities and towns across the state? On the second half of Newsmakers, we talk to the bill's sponsor, State Senator Ryan Pearson. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the program, my colleague, WPRI.com reporter, Ted Nisi. Hello, uh, U.S. Attorney Peter Nerona. Thank you for joining us, and welcome back to the program. Good morning. Glad to be back. Uh, I want to point out, as I, I said in the open of that, that uh, Charles Moreau may soon be out mm -hmm. of prison. We taped this program on a Thursday, which is one day before the uh, actual hearing, though many of you are watching it on a Sunday morning. Um, though we're going to talk about Charles Moreau now because a document has been publicly filed in federal court, and that is the plea agreement. Briefly, uh, just to set the stage here, former Mayor Charles Moreau was convic uh, convicted of accepting home repairs for giving out no-bid contracts to a contractor friend. The First Circuit, in another case, essentially uh, said that that kind of thing isn't a crime. Peter, to the casual observer, when people see Charles Moreau is being released from prison, the perception might be that the U.S. Attorney's Office made a mistake. Mm -hmm. What are people to think about this, that, that maybe Moreau didn't actually do anything wrong? Yeah, I think to answer that question fairly, you really have to go back in time and um, you know, consider where we were when the case was first charged. Uh, what we do in all cases of this magnitude is, um, is we take a very close look at the facts, and that factual investigation took multiple years. When we think we know what happened with the facts of the case, we then look at what legal theories um, best fit that conduct if there are criminal legal theories uh, that fit. Um, and that process can take days in my office. What we typically do is someone, uh, the, you know, the lead prosecutors will um, draft a memorandum which lays all that out. And we crunch that in the office. And what we try to do is find the right uh, legal theory that fits, as I said, those facts. Now, in this particular case, um, as we were getting ready to indict the mayor, um, it was very plain to us that the theory that fit the best was a gratuities theory of prosecution under the relevant statute. Um, there are other alternative theories. Bribery is one, um, and that's referenced in the plea agreement. Uh, but we felt that gratuities best fit those facts, and here's why. Uh, in a bribery case, uh, what the government has to prove is that uh, there's an agreement uh, at a point in time that you're going to do something in exchange for me doing something. So it's a quid pro quo on an immediate basis. Gratuities is slightly different, uh, and that's a situation where you do something and then I reward you uh, for doing it. Um, and based on what we knew about the facts at that time, um, that gratuities theory fit the best. Same statute, same penalty. Um, so we chose that uh, to proceed. Now what happened in the interim was uh, the First Circuit uh, threw us a curveball. You know, going into the case, the First Circuit had not ruled on that theory of prosecution. Every other circuit that had ruled on it across the country had found that gratuities was a crime. Accepting a gratuity in exchange for official uh, action was a crime. And so we felt very comfortable going into the case, uh, knowing that every other circuit that had dealt with it had looked at it our way. So you've advanced the ball, um, you know, about a year or so, and the First Circuit comes down with a case out of Puerto Rico that decides all of a sudden that uh, gratuities uh, is not a crime. And we should point out Puerto Rico is in the First Circuit. Puerto Rico's in the First Circuit. So now we're bound by that. And so the question then is you have to step back and you, uh, where are we now based on, uh, on that change in the law? Are there other theories that, that we could put forward uh, if need be? Those theories exist. Um, obviously, the, the plea, um, as, as we're talking today, the plea has not gone down. I expect that it will. Um, if it does, uh, there will be a plea uh, to bribery, to the bribery theory. Um, if not, then we'll proceed um, and we'll, we'll bring the case forward uh, as needed. We'll, we'll know more after, after Friday. If the plea goes down, let's just ask it plainly, mm -hmm. um, or, or say it, I mean, uh, Charles Moreau will be a convicted felon. No, absolutely. And I think that's the broader point to take from this, right? Whether it's a gratuities theory or a bribery theory. 
if the plea goes through as anticipated in the paperwork filed, uh, the mayor of Central Falls will be a convicted felon, convicted of bribery. Um, he will no longer be the mayor of Central Falls, obviously, and Central Falls has a new day going forward. So as I look at this, this is one of those situations where the law throws your curveball. Um, you, you make the best of it. Um, the overall picture, I think, is what I just laid out. I think Central Falls has a new day or is going to continue its new day forward. And most of all, I'm very proud of the work that the state police uh, and the prosecutors in the office did to get us to the point where the mayor of Central Falls took responsibility for his conduct. I expect that will happen tomorrow. If it doesn't, we're going to proceed. I have two more questions on this topic. How is this not double jeopardy? You were mm -hmm. essentially charging him again mm -hmm. for another crime, which normally you can't right. do. Why right. wouldn't Charles Moreau just go, I yeah. don't have to do this? Well, he, ha he can't have it both ways. If he goes into court and asks for the original plea to be vacated based on this change of the law, then we go back to square one and we start over. So that's why it's not double jeopardy. The slate is wiped clean, we start over. There are two ways to resolve the case, either by a new plea agreement or by us going forward with different and additional theories. And ultimately we reach the disposition that we did. And we'll see whether it goes through tomorrow. If not, then there's another, another step forward potentially. Uh, more broadly um, and outside of Moreau, what, what does the decision out of the First Circuit mean for future public corruption cases moving forward? Yeah, well I think, you know, going back to where we started, and that's why I started there, you know, we're going to have to be looking for those quid pro quo bribery cases, it makes it a little bit more difficult to take on public corruption in the First Circuit, which you know, for your viewers consists of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Maine, and Puerto Rico. So those of us in those five, um, those five states, uh, we're not thrilled with the Fernandez decision out of Puerto Rico, but you know, we'll, we'll make it work. That, see, that might almost be very concerning to uh, uh, people who live in a state that has a, a history of public mm -hmm. corruption. Do, does that mean because of the decision out of the First Circuit that as long as it's a refrigerator um, that happened after the fact and not cash as a pre, uh, quid pro quo, they can get away with it? Well, potentially, you know, potentially. Well, and, that, that's something. Well, it is something. And, you know, it's one of those situations, too, where, you know, one of the things about the, uh, about the, about the Moreau case was that was a case that broke and we had to go back and build that case retrospectively. One of the great advantages of some of the other cases we've done is that we've been involved in the investigation while the people we're investigating don't know that we're investigating them. And so we have a much better insight as to when the deal is made. Uh, with Moreau, because the, the facts uh, were historical, we had to look back and build the case out of paper, if you will, and out of interviewing witnesses who weren't either Moreau or Mr. Boothalette. It was very hard to get to that, where that state of mind was. And so that's why the gratuities theory fit better in that case. Certainly we're going to have to adjust the game plan. But I think another message that, that everyone should take from this is that the office is going to be relentless on these cases. We're going to keep going in these corruption cases. We view it as our top priority outside of national security. So we're going to be relentless. We're going to move quickly where we can. But I think other cases have shown that we'll use patience where it's necessary, but we're still going to push and we're going to push until we think justice is done. You know, another big topic in the news this week is uh, about legalizing marijuana in Rhode Island. It's really mm -hmm. blown up since the uh, right. Colorado situation began and they, they changed their law there. State Senator Miller, uh, Joshua Miller, is in the New York Times today on Thursday about uh, his proposal to legalize, regulate, and tax pot in Rhode Island. I'm just wondering, it would of course still be illegal marijuana under federal law, right. even if Rhode Island changed the state law. How would your office respond if that happened? Well, you know, this is a, an approach that the Department of Justice is taking sort of on a nationwide basis. And so we would learn from what the department has done um, in Washington State uh, and in Colorado. In fact, I had a conversation with the Colorado U.S. Attorney John Walsh just the other day um, about, about uh, this issue um, in the wake of the, uh, the governor's conference. You know, the, the department, um, there are really a couple of things the department's going to be looking at. Should we ever get to this point in Rhode Island? And I, and I hope that we don't, but let's assume we get there. Uh, the department is going to be looking at the diversion of marijuana to children. Um, it's going to be looking at um, whether or not organized uh, crime uh, activity is involved. It's going to be looking at how closely the state um, regulatory uh, scheme is put together. I mean, how, how strong is that regulatory scheme? And one thing I think that we shouldn't ignore is that Rhode Island is a small state and one of the major concerns of the department is let's assume Rhode Island chooses to go down uh, this path and say Massachusetts and Connecticut do not. If Rhode Island marijuana is moving into Massachusetts and moving into Connecticut, that is something that we, we would be very, very concerned about. And, and one last point, at least for me, uh, on marijuana is, you know, some of the reporting has been that this is a great way to, to raise tax revenue. Um, I would suggest that anyone who takes that view uh, might want to pay close attention to what the governor of Colorado said on that very point, which was that he thought that was a really bad reason 
to pass legalization. Um, I, I don't to quote him uh, to paraphrase what he said. Um, he said, you know, know that we know that marijuana doesn't make our people smarter and it doesn't make them healthier. And should government really be encouraging this behavior uh, and to go down this road for purposes of tax revenue and not take into account the human cost and a plan for that would really be a big mistake. One brief follow up on that. Uh, Rhode Island uh, uh, decriminalized marijuana mm -hmm. in its state law last year. Right. Have you seen any impact from that change? Yeah, well, that's in such small amounts, uh, Ted, that, you know, that's not the kind of case that we're, you know, we're really going to see. You know, that's really going to be an issue for state and local, you know, state and local authorities. Uh, drug overdoses in Rhode Island and really the Northeast have been mm -hmm. soaring mm -hmm. lately. What's going on here? And is there a resurgence that you're seeing in your office of heroin specifically? Yeah, you know, what, what we're seeing um, is uh, kind of a transition. As we've tried to crack down on the abuse of prescription narcotics, opiates, people are moving into the into, into heroin and we're seeing you know tremendous problems with that you know the Rhode Island statistics are I know well north of 60 overdoses since the first of the year there was an article in the Boston Globe yesterday or the day before there's been 185 right. dose, uh, overdoses in Massachusetts leaving out Springfield Worcester and Boston there are, I think um, 60 overdoses just in Taunton and so we're seeing this movement from the prescription pills as we crack down on that as we need to uh, people are turning to heroin, and that heroin is uh, impacting them in, in really significant ways, sometimes killing them. I think there's a message in there, too, right, when we talk about the war on drugs. You know, people say, why not just decriminalize all of, all of drug use, uh, uh, regulate it, if you will. Um, so if, if that's the case, how do you, uh, let's say we were to um, uh, legalize heroin, as, as outlandish as that seems, this is a fallout, right? You've got people literally dying from overdosing on heroin. If we don't, if we're going to go down that road, we have to be prepared to deal with this fallout. You know, treatment programs can't get cut, they need to be expanded. Um, you know, we really have to be prepared with this fallout. Sometimes I think this notion that legalizing drugs, um, uh, you know, sounds like a good idea, everyone will be happy, there won't be this, um, uh, this, uh, you know, this over-criminalization, if you will, but there's a huge fallout both from this and from gambling that if we're not committed to solving the fallout problems, we're really setting ourselves up for a real failure, I think. I have to ask you, uh, in September of 2012, your spokesman said your office had closed its investigation mm -hmm. into the 38 Studios mm -hmm. uh, situation matter there. Um, the state in its lawsuit is, is alleging pretty right. serious fraud. And to the layman, it, there might seem to be a disconnect there between the state alleging all this fraud right. by people mm -hmm. and misleading on the finances and taking the state, you know, uh, for right. a hook, and your office saying we don't see any breaking of federal laws we could prosecute there. How was that decision made, and, and right. is there any possibility you'll revisit it based on what comes out of the state lawsuit? Right. Fair question, Ted. You know, when that case broke, remember that $75 million in state money. You know, when, we, when we're looking at uh, cases that involve state money, particularly, again, if, it, if it's not a case that we have developed through our own sources, the FBI or someone else, if it's a case that's out there in the public domain, certainly the Attorney General's office knows about it, we know about it, State Police Bureau, everybody. What we try to do is we try to sit down and say, and who's going who's gonna to pursue this? Now, because it was state money, uh, the state police and the attorney general's office felt strongly that they had an interest in pursuing that case. And they are more than capable of pursuing it. If there's something there, they'll find it. If there isn't, I'm confident that they won't. What we did was we looked very narrowly and very carefully at whether there were any violations of federal law, had there been bank fraud committed. Um, again, my, as I think I was on just as this was breaking, Tim, I wanted to move very quickly to see whether there were those uh, potential crimes. If there were, we were going to move quickly. If there wasn't, then we were going to finish up and get out. And that's, that's what we've done. So I think, you know, to the extent any crimes were committed, um, that the state authorities are perfectly capable of handling that. I'm not saying there are or there aren't, but that's often the decision-making process that we go through. Another example is the Institute, um, the International Institute. Again, state Dan money. Dan Doyle. Dan Doyle, state money. Uh, Attorney General has a strong interest in that case. Uh, their office is very capable of doing those cases. Um, and so uh, we sit, we talk, we communicate, and, and we try to figure out who's, who's, um, who's in a position to do this. Just to put a, a period at the end of that sentence on Ted's question, uh, people at home should not anticipate that you would reopen any 38 Studios investigation. Not based on what I know, okay. no. All right, uh, we're at the end of our segment here. It goes by fast, but I'm just curious. You know, we're halfway through the president's final term. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate being the U.S. Attorney of Rhode Island? I know we're ways off, but in 2017? I do, I do. You know, I love the job. Um, I've been blessed to have it. I don't have any uh, other ambitions, and so uh, as long as the president will have me, I expect to stay on. You don't have any other ambitions? You know, sometimes we hear a little bit about <laughs> you have political ambitions no. and 
That's yeah, a straight no. That's a straight no. I, right. I, I love what I'm doing, and I have no desire to do anything. U.S. Attorney Peter Nerona, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, John. And when we come back, we're going to talk about a carrot and stick in the pension situation. Our guest is State Senator Ryan Pearson. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. And our guest for the second half is State Senator Ryan Pearson. His district covers Cumberland and Lincoln. Ted. Uh, Senator Pearson, thanks for being here. We wanted Thank to have much. you on because Tim and I last, uh, just a few months ago, did an investigation on how the cities and towns in Rhode Island that manage their own pension funds, we looked at what they knew about their investment returns and their fees, and what we found was that a lot of people didn't know much about it. A lot of them couldn't find the data. Others uh, didn't go back very far. And uh, you and I spoke shortly after, and you said, I actually have a bill that uh, relates directly to how all this works in their funding. So I want to ask you first just how that bill would work. I know you've put it in again this year. Um, first, as Tim mentioned at the top, the cities and towns could lose state aid. How would that be decided and why would they lose it? Yeah, so there's something around pensions called an annual required contribution. And so that's the amount of money that cities or towns have to put in every year to be able to make those payments. And so what we're looking to do here is if that, for whatever reason, that contribution isn't made, uh, we will withhold their state aid for that city or town, uh, give them a period of time to figure out a way in which they're going to make their payment uh, or fund a, get a funding plan to make their pension system healthy. Um, and when they get to the end of that road, um, they either have, they're making the payment, they have a plan to get it healthy, or we take that money uh, that's being withheld and we actually deposit it into the pension system for them making that payment. And again, for the people at home, we're talking very specifically about the local plans that are independently managed that aren't run by the state. Correct. Um, the other piece of your uh, bill, which is, and goes right to what we looked at in our Target 12 investigation, is you want this annual report from the general treasurer looking again at these independent plans. Yep. What would be in that report? What information do you not have now that you want to see? Yeah, so I mean, the first thing that, you, you know, as you found out through your investigation, it's very hard to get that information about what the funding status is. Um, but other really key issues are what are we paying as administrative costs as a percent of those assets and so a lot of these smaller funds just don't get the economies of scale around pricing and leverage in the market that the state system does and so one of the things that's been talked about a lot in the past is how do we sort of get out of this business of all these little local plans um, and move more into more of a state trust or a larger fund to get that so that's one of them. Um, another really important one is around what's that community's actual ability to pay their payments. Um, and so we can force them to make their payments all they want, but sometimes the underlying issue is there's a structural problem in that benefit structure in that the city or town, no matter what they could do, could never afford it. And so For example, wanna, maybe Central Falls a correct. few years ago. Um, you know, and even if you looked at you know, many other cities and towns, I mean, Coventry uh, is in a pretty terrible situation. Um, you know, Cumberland's fund is at, you know, in the 30% range now funded, and that liability went from about $7 million uh, six years ago to about just under $20 million today. And so the liabilities are growing, um, and the ability for the communities to actually meet those payments um, is something we need to be able to measure at the state. Because as you saw in Central Falls, when they, go, when they go broke and they can't make their payments, uh, what happens is they often come back to the state asking for the state to bail them out. So it's a big statewide issue. You know, that kind of goes into a question I had for you about the uh, withholding state aid if, yep. if they don't make, meet their ARC. And, you know, look, cities and towns are struggling financially, yep. uh, thanks in no part to state aid that was Absolutely. cut in the, ba uh, in the past and, and, of course, the national economy. And I'm sure many of them would say, yeah, look, uh, Senator Pearson, yep. love to make those payments but we're yep. poor. Yep. Wouldn't your bill yep. essentially make it worse for them? So it, it wouldn't. It would force them to face the reality of their situation. By um, withholding money they need. By withholding money they need, but for their own good. And I'll explain why a little bit. And so, you know, two things. We would withhold it until they either can make the payment or they have a plan to get to a place where they have a pension fund. And in the meantime, funded. they raise property taxes. In the meantime, they it's not that long of a period of time, so it's, it's a year's process that this goes through. And so, you know, it shouldn't, when they're doing their budget, they would not, it would be the next year's revenue that they'd be putting in jeopardy. So okay. it wouldn't be the prior years. Um, so if they refuse to address it and they didn't want to work with us and didn't want to do it, but what we're, what we're asking them to do is either you need to make your payment if you can. If you can't, you need to have a plan on how you're going to get there. Um, and we've seen that uh, we did a little bit of a carrot approach last year and offering some incentive aid, and that's really pushing communities uh, to do this. And so a lot of them are moving in that direction for that incentive aid. Um, what we're trying to do now is we're trying to add an extra lever. Um, and this is something, by the way, that is in state law already, but for the state plans we were talking about earlier. So for the state-run municipal plans, this language already exists. It's been in place as far as, as I know, um, and it's one of the main reasons why the MERS, or the state local plan, has been much more funded, 20 to 30 percentage 20 to 30 percentage points higher 
than local plans. All right, real quick, you tried to get this bill passed last year. Yes. What happened? We passed it in the Senate. Right. Um, unanimously, if we, I remember we right. We did pass it in the Senate unanimously. Uh, we, it came to the Finance Committee. We passed it. Um, it went over to the House. Uh, it was got it was pretty late in the session, and so uh, it didn't make it out of the House last year. Uh, Rep. Shikarchi on the House side is now a uh, sponsor on, the, on that side, and so my uh, goal is to get it out as early as I can in the Senate, and, and hopefully uh, the House will So have you think it was just the timing of the I House? Think so. What You didn't hear anything about issues no, with no, it? No, I think it was probably just like the timing towards the end. As you know, it gets very, very busy, um, and we sort of got to it a little bit late. So okay. I'm, I'm pretty uh, Do you think leadership is willing to do this? Do you expect a lot of opposition from cities and towns if they think you get some real legs on getting this passed? Yeah, I mean, I, quite honestly, it's a really hard thing for any mayor or administrator to walk up and say, I don't want this, um, because it's basically admitting that they have no real responsibility or desire to solve their fiscal problems. So um, I doubt it. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things that obviously there, there will be, you know, maybe some discussion about it. But at the end of the day, what we're really asking here is let's be honest, let's fix the problems we have, um, and let's learn from a system that's worked well, which is MERS, that forces them to make those payments. Speaking of pensions, obviously, we yeah. have to ask you about this proposed settlement yeah. of the state pension law, which I believe passed before you took it office, did. right? So you didn't vote on it at the time. Um, first of all, just what's your take as a, as a lawmaker on yeah. the, the structure of the settlement and how it was how yeah. it came about? So, um, you know, as you know, and as probably most of your viewers know, we weren't involved in any of the uh, sort of settlement discussions, so we're just learning about it now. We're just becoming involved in it. Um, you know, if you think back of the situation, and again, the cities or towns, you know, and, and I was a local elected official, so I get it, um, have really had years and years and years of really tight budgets. Um, the, the reform as it was took out just about $4 billion out of the unfunded liability, and that's hundreds of millions annually to the state and cities or towns. And so preserving those savings is really really important so we continue to do the services we have to in education and in healthcare, care etc um, what has come out in the settlement um, is a is a pretty modest uh, adjustment um, so about 95 percent of the savings are intact um, it's adding about 232 million or so to the long-term unfinal livability or about 26 million on an annual basis relatively small when you size it up against a four billion dollar risk you to sound the like state. you like it um, it's too early. Um, and so I have a, a million questions because we were not involved in um, the discussions that's coming brand new to us. Um, I have a lot of questions about the legality um, around what this means long term. Um, if there's some sort of precedent being set around does this bind any sort of future changes? Um, because as you know, the whole question on this lawsuit is was the action taken by the assembly constitutional? Right. Was, um, is it allowed to make change pensions? Exactly. Um, and so that question is really, really important. Um, and the other one is, uh, you know, there's um, you know, for instance, another Cranston has opted out of this settlement. Um, so there's there's a lot of questions. Um, there's a lot of hearings that we have to do. I wasn't there, but the assembly did. Uh, you know, I believe it was over 30 hours of public testimony on this, um, and I certainly expect that you know, the assembly will do its due diligence again. Um, you know, the, the separation of powers is there. Uh, the executive branch has spoken, the judicial, and we need to weigh in again. Let me ask you though about one question about the politics of it. Yeah. I mean, you're 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 uh, you talk to leadership up there. You you keep your ears to the ground. I mean, what's the sense? Is there mm -hmm. any appetite? I mean, we've heard we had Nick Mattiello, the House Majority Leader, on yeah. here a few weeks ago. He was saying it's possible he won't take it up at all. You, you know, your yeah. boss, Teresa Pye, we did not sound too thrilled that this was coming up again. Is there really yeah. an appetite to dig well, into this and do it again? Yeah, so in fairness, I don't think anybody's excited for it to come back, right? I mean, this was, and I wasn't there, um, but for so many of people, this was a very, very tough issue. This affected people in their communities. You know, some of the senators, it was their parents, they were cutting their colas. I mean, this was not easy for anybody to do, and so nobody wants to see it come back. Um, however, it is a very serious issue. There's four billion dollars on the line. Um, that's big money for the state, and so um, I, I absolutely expect that the assembly uh, will consider it. I believe there will be hearings. Um, I don't know what the end result will be. I personally haven't decided, and then I would say probably, I guess, none of my colleagues have decided either. I want to take a much smaller look at something. Your your town has four fire districts, does, I yeah. believe. Um, you know, many fire districts have their own taxing authority. They come with their own police chiefs. They yep. get their own police chief vehicles. Yep. Um, is it time to to do away with it? I mean, if you think of Coventry, yep. those fire districts are in tough shape. Um, what can yeah. be done about this? What so, do you so we we took care of this last year for Cumberland uh, in a bill that uh, we passed last year, both sides, and it actually takes effect with this year's elections. And so, the four districts in Cumberland will become one. Um, it was something that was started several years ago. Uh, the voters of the town voted, uh, and 80 percent, not surprisingly, uh, said, "Yeah, it makes sense. We should really consolidate our four fire districts." And so, um, it wasn't easy. Um, it is, you know, each four districts have their own issues, have their own labor contracts, their own everything about it. Um, but really importantly, 
it is the future, um, and it is where we need to move. These governance models, I believe the oldest one in my district was from 1871, <laughs> is when the charter was passed by the General Assembly. I think it's time for a new governance model. <laughs> um, I hate to break it to you. Um, and so we've moved the bar there, um, and you know, just like, um, we've also made sure that we're, we're instituting stability. Um, and so just like I'm attempting to take something that's worked well in state law and pensions and apply it to local pensions, um, there's a tax cap. Uh, 3050 is very famous on municipal tax levies. Fire districts are not uh, covered Caps. by that. Yeah. Um, and so it is now in Cumberland. Um, and we put it directly in the charter for that new district this year. In uh, less than 20 seconds, yep. Senator, who are you supporting for governor? I haven't made any decisions yet. Um, I think the Democratic Party, we have some great candidates this year. I consider many of them friends. Um, Do you see yourself endorsing anyone before the primary? I don't. No, okay. I don't. Safe. Safe. <laughs> Staying safe. I'm, you know, I do have my own race to worry about this year. State <laughs> Senator Ryan Pearson, thanks Thank for joining us. If you missed any of it, it's online, WPRI.com. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.